It's episode 96 of the Big Seance Podcast. I'm on my way in the car to Alton, Illinois for the 2017 Haunted America Conference. And buckle up because I'm taking you with me. Here we go. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. In two miles, take exit 31B on to ML 367 North toward Alton, Illinois. Once we get to our destination today, and of course we're heading to the 2017 Haunted America Conference, you're going to hear from paranormal researcher and artist April Slaughter, Adam Drendel, the founder of HauntedIllinois.com, Rob Demarest of Ghost Hunters International and Haunting Australia, our friends Greg and Dana Newkirk of the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and the Occult, forensic psychologist and parapsychology researcher Sarah Soderland, all-around paranormal expert and author Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and two more friends who will be making a return visit to the show at the end of the episode. And that's Diane and Denise from the History Goes Bump podcast. I wanted to get their takeaways from the weekend. One of the reasons why I get so excited to bring coverage of conferences like this to you is because often I feel so many of the cool meetings of the minds tend to happen far away from me on either of the coasts, and I'm stuck right in the middle. There are so many conferences and events, either for podcasting or for the paranormal, that just aren't easy for a teacher in Missouri to get to. Well, I'm lucky enough to have the oldest and one of the largest paranormal conferences not far from me, thanks to Troy Taylor, and so it would be silly to miss this one. And since I know it's not possible for many of you to attend an event like this, this is my way of bringing it to you. Recording speakers during their sessions is typically not allowed at these things, so once again, I pretty much just stalked people in the vendor area to get the scoop on what they're up to, and in some cases, we'll get the gist of what their presentations covered. And you also need to know that the voices you hear from today weren't the only speakers and vendors at the conference. It was a busy and crowded place, and so these are just a few of the folks I was able to get to to bug for an interview. And I want to thank every one of them for contributing. As people arrived this year, we walked into a surprise performance by two familiar voices to me. The band Sunspot was playing before Troy Taylor kicked off the weekend and the Friday night speakers panel. I was familiar with Sunspot because Mike and Wendy also host the See You on the Other Side podcast, which you would probably love, and they feature a lot of their music in their show. And the coolest thing about their music is a lot of it has a paranormal theme, and they even wrote a song dedicated to Greg and Dana Newkirk, which they performed that night. And it was hilarious. Here's just a little taste of Sunspot. It's from a song called Skeleton Key, Secret Lives of Ghosts. And at the very end of the show, I'll play the whole thing and let you know where you can find more Sunspot. Thanks, Mike and Wendy. First stop, April Slaughter. 
So I'm sitting here talking to April Slaughter, who I missed last year. And I was really bummed that I didn't get to talk to her. But she had a story last night uh, in the the speakers did their panel. And the, the story was really fascinating of some events that happened last year. And I remember at the panel last year, I asked you about what you said was your final public seance you had a seance and and you answered why it was your public seance and last one and I thought that was interesting but can you just kind of retell the story um yeah I you know I've only done a handful of seances because my focus has really just been in ITC research and different various forms of spirit communication but people have recently kind of regrown an interest in seances you know and um I did a few, and they went well, uh, but I always felt a little unsettled. Um, not because I'm afraid of the sort of things that happen during seances, but just the energies that come at you from people in a room can, can really be overwhelming. So I had made up my mind that last year was going to be my last public one, because um, I just had a feeling that it should be. And then I was proven right in that <laughs> assumption, um, because what happened was... I had a group of about 40 or so people in the room, and I only knew a handful of people in there, which is normal. And um, I sat down and I got started, and some good, positive, happy things were flowing. I was getting a lot of good messages for people in the room. And then I was interrupted by the, just a, a, it's like something entered the room. I just knew it. And, and I didn't know if everyone else in the room could feel it, but I felt it. And then to my right, there was a little nook that most people couldn't see in the room. And there was just this mass. I don't know how to explain it. It was just this fluid kind of a dark mass. And it put off an energy that really distressed me. And so I paused and um, it felt aggressive toward me specifically. So I asked that a male energy or, or male friends in the room stand between me and this thing so that I could continue doing what I was doing. Um, but I wasn't able to because as they stood between me and whatever this energy was, it affected them. Um, and got angrier because it couldn't approach me as easily. Because um, I was, you know, psychic pores were open and, and parasitic things can really do some damage. So I was trying to minimize that danger. And whatever this was, it uh, started making people in the room angry at each other for no reason. It started making people ill. Um, and I really felt threatened, like physically threatened, not just but spiritually But other threatened. people were noticing oh, this absolutely. as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah, and right. even before I had a chance to really verbalize what was happening, people were like, something's going on, I see this, and they were getting really scared. Uh, and not in a good way, not in a fun, entertaining way, it was, this is threatening, I don't like it. Um, and so I made the choice to, to put an end to it, uh, as far as that went, that sit sitting, um, but it wasn't done with me. And it wasn't done with several other people in the room. And so it took, it took a while to kind of clear myself of that. Um, and, you know, it just, it just proved to me that I made the right choice and, and not doing that. Because I don't think, I think whoever, there was an intent set. Somebody who came to my seance wanted to see that happen and wanted to see something harmful happen. And to me, that's not okay. So I was like, oh, yep, I'm, I'm never doing this again, um, and right, rightfully so. I'm happy to do it with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a tough thing when you try to do positive things, put a positive spin on things that people are afraid of, and then someone, you know, kind of trashes it. It was, it was a really frightening thing, and people who are skeptical, like Troy Taylor, you know, he was, he was really affected by it. And so I'm like, I know it wasn't just me. Um, so yeah, it was a rough thing. It was it was a but you know, I'm grateful for the experience cuz now I know that, you know, what what I should and should not do in a public yeah. setting. And at a conference, you're dealing with all kinds of people and their energies too, but you know, a hotel to me is a similar situation like hospitals Absolutely. and schools where there are a lot of maybe attached energy and emotions going on. But I just thought that was a fascinating story. Yeah, it, yeah. like I said, it is a fascinating story. Uh, one I hope not to relive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For the rest of us, it was yes. a fascinating story sure. to listen to. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a book out, and you've got some other things here, and you also do some artistic things with skulls. I do, yeah. It uh, started off as a hobby. I just wanted a, a skull that didn't look gift store cheesy, kind of, you know? And so I made one. And it had all kinds of archaic symbols on it. And uh, a musician friend of mine saw it and said, I want it. I'm like, no, it's mine. But anyway, long story short, every time I made a new one, it ended up in his hands because he wanted it. And then other musicians and people started taking notice. And he said, April, you really need to sell these. I'm, 
okay. So I tried it, and yeah, now it's like a whole other business. I can't seem to keep keep them. So <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun, and it's it's a kind of a morbid little hobby, but it seems to really resonate with a lot of people, and for a lot of different reasons. So it's fun. There's a nerdy group out there love who it. will love it. Those are my people. Yeah, the nerdy groups are my people. Yeah, yeah. So where do we find you and all of your stuff? You can go to either AprilSlaughter.com or SlaughterSkulls.com, and it'll lead you both to the same place. I have my books there, uh, my different artistic projects. Uh, you can commission different things. Uh, my my writings, my appearances, all that sort of stuff you can find on the website. You rock. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Then I met Adam Drendel of hauntedillinois.com. Tell us what hauntedillinois.com is. Okay. Uh, hauntedillinois.com is a promotional website that uh, basically has been going since 1999 promoting everything haunted within the state. Uh, We've got uh, a lot of ghost stories posted from various authors and sources, as well as uh, directories, a directory of ghost tour companies, another directory of uh, paranormal groups, and another directory of uh, uh, real haunted places throughout the state. So it's kind of like a the large archive of everything haunted within Illinois. So. so you've probably got a lot of content out of a lot of the people in this room, actually. Well, we, we do actually. Uh, we do have a, a large uh, chunk of uh, content from uh, Troy Taylor has donated quite a bit to us, and we're thankful for that. So we have that, and as well as uh, other noted authors like uh, Edward Edward Shanahan from Chicagoland area and uh, various other people that were taking submissions from. So it's our goal to be the source of wanted information for the state of Illinois. And are, you, and are you on social media as well? No, absolutely. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest. We're kind of everywhere. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. I traded it for a laptop. Uh-huh. So cool. I'm sitting here. I'm talking to Rob Demarest. And I've watched you on TV. This is the first time I've seen you at an event. It's really exciting to see you. I, w- I just wanted to know if to give us something to talk about it. You last night at the speakers panel were talking about kind of the passion and having to have the passion. And if you don't have it, maybe you should step away. I don't know. I just thought that was an interesting thing. Do you mind kind of repeating a little bit of what you said there? Yeah, I, mean, I can I can definitely elaborate on that a little bit. And and what I'm saying is, this what we do. I, I put it like this: when you go into a swimming pool filled with mud, you don't come out clean. And this profession, that's what you do. So you really gotta like feel like you're doing something. This isn't TV repair. You're dealing with some dark stuff out there, and that's my belief. Other people would say, oh, it's nothing. It's all, it's all in good fun. It's not what I believe. So when I got to a point, I did TV. I was doing TV. It was in my fourth year, constant. Six weeks at a time, five days off, six more weeks. And so I got to the point where I was just going through the motions. Is there anyone here? Can you knock twice? And I got to a point where I started saying, wow, I either got to start reinvesting myself in this or quit after 30 years and I reinvested myself and I think I'm better for it what do you have going on now you've got do you have any books or anything and do you have no you're just kind of hanging with the community and no I don't I don't like the community no I'll be real I don't like most people in the paranormal and that's the reality I'm I would say that you know I always say that I'm one of the most hated people in the paranormal field for good reason. Oh, yeah, absolutely true, because I call it as I see it, and everyone else is scared to rock the boat. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just saying that I, where other people say, I could get a show if I said this. I'd rather not get the show and be honest. You know what I mean? And so when, when you know, we always say history is written by the victors, Right. So at the end of the day, the victors are going to be the other guys. It's not going to be me. So I know that in the end of the day, I'll be painted as, you know, that jerk. I'm okay with that because I I sleep well at night. I feel good about myself most of the time, you know, um, when I'm not picking on the person next to me. But 
Look, at the end of the day, um, I don't do, you know, a lot of people do this for money. They do it for fame. Um, they do it to, to they, they feel like the paranormal owes them something. I feel like it's the opposite. I owe something to the paranormal. You know, when you go into a haunted house, you are going into their house. So why do you feel like, if you don't make a noise, then I'm going to be mad? Really? If I came into your house and said, hey, make a noise, you'd kick me in the junk and throw me out the door. So why do we think if someone's deceased or in a different form, why do we think it's the opposite? But anyway, I go on and on. I just took up an entire podcast instead of one shout out. So <laughs> that is me, Rob Demers, Ghost Hunters International, Haunting Australia, Telemundo, Univision, signing off. Well, do you have a site or anything? Where do we find you? Where do you find me? In Florida. Okay, all right. I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't do, I hardly ever do events. I ghost hunt. I don't do events unless I'm broke. Well, I appreciate you being here, and your honesty is what I, I, I liked I'm, last night. I don't do this one. From, I'll lose money on this weekend, guaranteed. And I don't have money. But I did this. You know, I posted about it last night on Facebook. I did this because some of the people here are some of the most real people in the paranormal. So to, to have Troy invite me was huge. You don't see, look around for the other people who have been on TV. You know, Dr. Dr. Renee Cruz, who's over there, she was on a bunch of shows here and there, but she didn't have a show. You don't get invited to this if you were one of the TV guys who go, what was that? I heard kill Zach. I mean, not Zach. I mean, it could be anyone. Jack, Jack, kill Jack. But anyway, um, so if you're looking for me, I'm always on Facebook. I'm on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash Rob Demarest. Facebook, I... I'm at, I don't have a fan page anymore. I took it down. I'm at 5,000 friends, but everything I write is public. I don't hide anything. So if you follow me, you're going to get the same updates everyone else does. You rock. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Have a good day. All right. So we're here with the new Kirks again at the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and the Occult. And we've had him on an interview recently. And this was one of the coolest parts about uh, last year's event. And I know this this was your first time last year, right, yeah. when you came. And it's kind of deja vu. They're in the same corner of the vending room. It's kind of cool. So tell us maybe what's new. You were telling me last night some things that are new. But, oh, my gosh, you've also got the cool. Man, you're making, like, world news with this scanning of Billy and everything. So talk, whatever you want to talk about, about what's been going on lately with the museum. Man, we have been uh, just slammed lately. It's great. It's great. Uh, we've been doing all kinds of new stuff. You talked a little bit about the 3D scanning initiative we started. We started a, an initiative about four months ago. As far as we know, it's never been done before. And we're trying to create a, an online database of 3D scanned haunted objects. So haunted, cursed, or just paranormally significant. And it's proven to be a lot more uh, interesting than we anticipated because it turns out that a lot of the artifacts don't want to be scanned. So you're going to move beyond Billy in the Dybbuk box with scanning? Oh, we have already scanned probably almost two dozen things at wow. this point. And wow. uh, some of them have been more trouble than others. But, uh, yeah, we've, we've scanned the Dybbuk box. We've scanned Billy. We've scanned uh, the mask was the most recent thing we've scanned. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a really cool, interesting project because you know the idea with the traveling museum was we wanted to take the museum to people, to people who don't have a chance to go to a museum in you know New England or Vegas, and that's just kind of an extension of that mission. Now people are going to be able to actually visit a virtual museum. Anyone can go to it. And uh, hopefully we're going to extend that to other museums that have haunted items and just build this really big, cool database. The interesting thing, though, is we've been 3D printing a lot of the scans that we've been doing, and those have started to show uh, some of the traits of their parents. So we've given those to different people, and they're like, something's wrong with this print. <laughs> it's acting in a way I didn't expect. So... There's this unintended consequence of this project where some of the haunting is rubbing off on these things. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. We're learning a lot. 
So we've been doing that. Um, new artifacts are coming in all the time. Uh, the museum is, I mean, normally we have a psychomantium that people can use now. We've oh, got another shut one. Up. Oh, yeah. It's, but I mean, we, we had to do kind of a pared down version because we kind of had an idea of the space. And uh, you're gaining so many items, you're having to pick and choose. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's just, I mean, there's a few like Billy and Ruby who come every single time. Um, but now it's at the point where we're running out of room in the car. We're running out of room in the house. <laughs> it's getting out of control. <laughs> and Ruby, there was a story with Ruby. I think a lot of people know this story that people have shared from last year's Haunted America conference. And last night, I, I whispered to Ruby my room number and, and told her she was welcome to come, you know, pester me. I don't know that I've had her visit me yet, but I'm here for another night, so we'll see. you got to leave your recorder running. Oh, that's a good tip. There you go. Oh, it's, now, duh, why didn't I do that last night? Oh, my gosh. We we actually just heard another part of the Ruby story from last year. Because, uh, like, last year, Lisa, one of the organizers, uh, she actually had a picture of Ruby on her phone. That's right. But it was taken after she had already been packed up and put in the car. It was at, like, 2.43 in the morning. And Lisa had never even come over to this point. She was so busy, she'd never had a chance to come over here. Unbeknownst to us, there was another chapter of that story that she was too embarrassed to tell until recently. She got home, and her Netflix account had been totally wiped out. <laughs> everything that she had pre-programmed in there, everything she'd watched, all her custom lists, they were gone. And there was only one custom list, and it was for Ruby, and it was all movies about dolls. Shut up. You can ask her. And you just learned that this week. Just learned that last wow. night. So there's strange stuff. That Any on. movie deals for Ruby coming your way <laughs> soon? Uh, I, not that I know of, no. I think the, the Haunted Doll movies are uh, a little done. They're a little over. Yeah, the, the market's flooded right now. So. Well, tell us again where we can find you. Uh, if anybody wants to keep up on what we're doing, they can just go to paramuseum.com. You rock. And I know that, that uh, Greg and Dana are on Twitter as well and Facebook, and I like to bug them on there. So they are around, and you'll find them. This is, you've really got to see their uh, – you got to check out their site, and if you ever have – they've been all over. They've gone to, like, every uh, conference in the world, it seems, lately. And so if you have a chance to see them, you need to. Thanks, dude. Always good to see you. Yay! Okay, so um, I just finished bugging Greg, and so here's Dana, and she's going to do a comedy routine. No, I'm just kidding. What's, uh, what do you like to add to uh, this nerdiness here this weekend? I feel like, I don't know, I'm, I'm let me think of the best way. I'm, I consider myself the better half, maybe. Is that, am I allowed to say that? You can say whatever you want. Uh, the, true. the better half. I'm like, you know, keeping Greg a little grounded. And sometimes, like last night, he didn't seem to let want to let you talk. He's he's like that usually. I, I'll have like a, a hilarious quip to add in there occasionally. You know, well, here's the thing: I don't speak often, but when I do, it's good stuff. Genius stuff. <laughs> I like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, you rock. No, thank you very much. You do too. <laughs> See, a little bit goes a long way, right? <laughs> If you haven't heard my full interview with Greg and Dana, check out episode 81 from December 14th, 2016. I'll put that link in the show notes. Continuing our trip around the room. Okay, so I'm sitting here with Sarah Soderland, and I saw her speak last year. It was the first time I'd ever learned anything about her last year. And I'm here to tell you, I don't know. She does a lot of things, and she's going to have to really compress it to tell you everything that she does in this amount of time. However, I think she needs to be a paranormal comic because... Um, she's hilarious, and I could listen to her. Even if I don't understand what she's saying, because she gets kind of deep, I could listen all day because she's hilarious. And I've read your book, and tell us a little bit about that, too, and maybe just kind of about what you spoke about today. You just spoke a little bit early today. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, my first book, Haunted by the Abyss, is a nonfiction kind of chapter-chapter experience of some of my 
weird paranormal phenomenon and then the kind of introspective hindsight trying to process it as a psychologist now and being like is this a false memory is this trauma like what are these things and it you know the readers I was nervous at first because it's pretty open-ended you don't get like someone dies or something ends it's very open-ended to your own thinking which is kind of what I'm about you know so today we talked about what is haunted and being haunted, is it in your mind? Is it an obsession? Is it a mental illness? Is it an anxiety? Is it energy? Is it an imprint? And we kind of delved into the quantum world, which I just launched a new book called Quantum Parapsychology with a friend of mine, Dave. And we talk about everything from entanglement to multi-worlds and verses and all these different things that I think that for people who want to maybe detach emotionally and really do more objective research, that science right now is in that really cool unpublished precipice area where you have to take the extra effort, but synchronicity happens in a place like this where you're getting lectures and meeting people and reading books and you see how it all comes together. And so that's what it is. I'm here at the the booth sitting next to Rob Demarest. We're doing um, pictures. I'm doing haunted photography. I love doing photography in my spare time. And at a haunted location one time, I, I left the shutter open for eight seconds. And I had a friend run across the hall, you know. And I went showing everybody in the break room and the safe room, like, I got a ghost. Look at it. It's right here. And everybody's minds were blown. They were like, it's in the camera. She's not even taking it out of the camera. It can't be Photoshopped. How'd she do it? And I waited until my guilt was just heavy enough that I was like, okay, let me show you how I did this. And you can have a ghostly photo too. And just being able to show people that light matters, perception matters, and that all of that is measurable and so it helps us kind of measure ourselves and understand ourselves and grow upward. And that's what, as a forensic psychologist, I try and take the nitty gritty and make it a little bit more fun and exciting. But that's what we're here for. And I think you promote having an open mind, too, I it do. sounds. Yeah. I do. There's no right and wrong. There just is. And I love information. I don't care if it's right or wrong. Uh, that, to me, doesn't, it's kind of, you know, would you rather be right or happy? I, I would rather be knowledgeable than right or wrong. So I don't care. I want to hear people's stories, and, and, and later I can take that and think why, and then I get to enhance myself. So I love it. We both investigated the church, the haunted church, last year, and you started to say something about that in the speaker's panel earlier. Do you remember having any experiences, or do you remember taking anything away from that? I just wondered, because I don't tend to feel a lot of things... I right. tend to be like a rock. And right. so I wondered what you felt, if you remembered. I do remember. I remember it very vividly because, and, and I don't want to put any negative damper on anything with that location because it was very active. But, you know, when you go into a spot like that, you take into account how many people are there, and there was a bigger group, and it's a smaller space, and there's cars driving around, so you got to kind of remove light refraction and reflection and... There was a lot of suggestive A lot of suggestive stories. Like you get a tour beforehand, and that's one of those things I hate. I hate having any information beforehand. And, you know, I sat down quietly in a backspace and witnessed something kind of moving out of my peripheral that I worked on for about 20 minutes to see if I could recreate, and I couldn't. Um, and there were some strange things happening, and, and you just have to wonder if it's that location or that story or if it's the suggestion. <laughs> Because without the suggestion, I may not have thought anything other than the weirdness you might get sitting in an empty church. In the dark, yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, I, that's, those are the things I'm interested in. Is If you have two groups of people go in and one has a story and one doesn't, how does the reaction change? Because it does. And, uh, yeah, thinking about the cool stuff. Yeah, where do we find you? Well, you can find me in Minneapolis, Minnesota. No, I'm kidding. Uh, You can find me at sarahsoderland.com. If you Google Paranormal Sarah or if you're on Twitter, at Paranormal Sarah, if you're at Facebook, The Paranormal Sarah, if you're wherever. Uh, if you, you can find Paranormal Sarah just about anywhere, but sarahsoderland.com will take you there, too. You rock. Thank you. Ah, you rock. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And see you guys next year if you're not here. Yeah, be here. Oh, you rock. Thank you. I appreciate it. And no coverage of the Haunted America Conference would be complete 
without checking in with Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who referred to me by name when from the audience at the speaker's panel, I asked a question, and I wasn't wearing a name tag. And that was kind of like an Elvis moment. Ellen Guiley, so be jealous. And uh, <laughs> she's, she's here very often at the Haunted America conference, and you actually just finished your talk earlier this morning so i wondered if maybe you'd give us a little a little hint of what you talked about and then i also just want to you've got a you've got a podcast going on now right or a radio show it's a and live broadcast show uh on kgra it's called strange dimensions and it runs every wednesday night 8 to 10 p.m eastern cool so tell us a little bit about what you talked about this morning my topic this year was interdimensional paraphysical Sasquatch. And uh, as a lot of my audience knows, I'm involved in just about everything unusual. The paranormal, uh, cryptids, uh, UFOs, metaphysics, and spiritual development because everything overlaps and cross-connects. And uh, I have been very engaged for the past several years in entity contact experiences of all kinds. Not ghost residues, but uh, where something that is not human is engaging with us uh, in an intelligent way, uh, either in a helpful, beneficial way or a hostile, threatening, and hurtful way. And so that's led me into all kinds of areas, including Sasquatch. Um, and uh, I feel that the evidence um, not only is mounting, but it's been there to begin with. It's just been ignored by so many researchers that Sasquatch is not a physical Earth species, not a holdover from some prehistoric time. There's no bag of Bigfoot going on here with uh, a body and bones and blood samples and whatnot. We are dealing with uh, a, a, a species that lives on the Earth with us, but in an alternate reality. And they are quite intelligent. They have what we would consider uh, supernormal uh, powers, psychic abilities, and the ability to be invisible and teleport. And they have the ability to come into our reality uh, at will. And I, I believe that they find these portal areas on the planet where the veils between dimensions are thinner. And uh, some of them are interested in us, and some of them think we're very primitive and uh, we're to be avoided. And I, frankly, I can understand why. So the gist of my talk was about how the evidence is there and it's mounting because more and more witnesses are coming forward. And that's when a horrible thing happened. The memory card in my recorder was full. And the culprit was a 10-hour recording from when I stayed by myself overnight at the Lemp Mansion this last fall. I totally forgot it was on the recorder. Just one of the struggles of being a super para nerd. So I didn't know my recording had stopped, which makes me sad, because we talked for another couple of minutes. But as soon as I realized it about five minutes later, I jotted down notes so that I could paraphrase her final thoughts. I asked Rosemary how she chooses the next journey in her research, and if years ago she would have ever imagined some of the far-out topics that she's now considered to be an expert on, like the gin, for example. She said she started out in the 80s just ghost hunting and being interested in the ghost side of things in general. And ever since then, the evidence and what shows up in that evidence is what always takes her on to the next chapter of her research. Well, thank you, Rosemary, and I'm so sorry your wisdom got cut off. You can find Rosemary's site at visionaryliving.com. She's also on Facebook, and she's at Rosemary underscore Guiley on Twitter. I participated in one After Hours event at the conference this year, and it was an investigation of the Mineral Springs Hotel in Alton. And it was really cool. I may have more on that in a future episode. But for now, I'll leave you with a link to my photos from that night and to the second episode of Troy Taylor's amazing brand new podcast 
called the American Hauntings Podcast, which appropriately enough, this episode covers everything you'd want to know about the Mineral Springs Hotel in Alton. Perfect timing, right? I should mention Troy's co-host, and I believe the producer of the podcast, is Cody Beck. It's a really great show, and I think if you're a fan of Troy's work, you'll love the podcast too. The link will be in the show notes. And here with me now for a return appearance, the ever so popular Diane and Denise from the History Goes Bump podcast. What's up, guys? Hey, Patrick. Long time no see. Hey, Patrick. It's been forever. I know. It's like it's almost been four days. <laughs> <laughs> at least at the so time bad. of this recording. You two are really fun to hang out with. And I'm telling you, your group of spooktacular members, your crew that came to this meetup and several other meetups that you did is so impressive. You had a lot of cool peeps join you for this trip. I was really impressed. It really is humbling. And we had them, I think, what did we count? Six different states that people came in from? I think so. Something like that. Yeah. And it just, you know, you know how it feels, Patrick, when you have listeners meet up with you. You're just amazed that these people would travel to meet up with you. And Obviously, they came to the conference as well. But yeah, it was very cool. And we all hung out for more than just the meetings. We went and did some extracurricular type things. And it was a lot of fun. It was a ton of fun. Right up my alley. I loved it. Oh, yeah. All kinds of nerdy stuff. If I'm not mistaken, you both were able to sit in most of the sessions, right? I think we only missed one. Okay. We didn't go to the final one. But I do have to tell you that... You happened to miss out on the one where Troy Taylor was talking about the Amityville horror and how gullible people were and that kind of thing. And uh, you had been sitting there, I think, because they did the raffle before that. And (laughs) That's when I started to not feel very well, and I was nodding off. And I was like, "Uh, I'm going to have to make my exit now, or I'm trapped. And so Troy was talking about the fact that you had brought up on your... You interviewed... Guy Guy Lion Playfair. Yes, that did the Enfield Poltergeist. And so he got into talking about that and The Conjuring 2. And obviously he was talking about the Warrens when it comes to Amityville Horror. And all of a sudden he goes, yeah, because Patrick, are you here? <laughs> and you just knew that he was wanting to ask you about your interview there. Uh. Because that's where we got the information as well that we shared on one of our episodes. when We talked about the history of ghost hunting. We referred back to your episode there and said, you know... The Warrens said that they were very involved with the Enfield Poltergeist, and obviously The Conjuring 2 makes it look like they were really involved, but we know via Patrick's interview that that was not the case. <laughs> I I felt really dumb for missing that one. I felt bad after you guys told me that. That's that's cool that he threw my name out there, though. And you had that happen twice. Twice, I know. Look at Mr. Popularity here. (laughs) Rosemary Ellen Guiley did it off the stage, too. And I'm like, we know, Patrick. (laughs) (laughs) And I was trying to play that one off, too, because as soon as she said my name and I looked down and I'm like, well, am I wearing a name tag? No. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) She, like, knows who I am. (laughs) But she wasn't like Heather when we were able to say we see you and you popped up looking around like, who's watching me? So (laughs) that was us. You guys were being creepers from the back of the room. We were totally creepers because I was like, wait, <laughs> is that the side of Patrick's head? And she was like, I don't think so. I said, mm, that looks like Patrick up there. And so she, then she looked and then so when she put that and you popped up, she's like, oh, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I missed many of the sessions, actually, because I decided to take advantage of the less busy moments in the vendor room to get the interviews that I've shared in this episode And like I said, I ended up not feeling well for much of the second day. So I decided to beg you two to come on and give kind of a a report, no pressure, or your takeaways from some of the sessions. And you guys didn't know I was going to do that. So I appreciate you being brave enough to come on and just kind of share your thoughts. Which ones, were there any that stood out to you, any of the sessions or speakers? 
Well, first of all, when it comes to the conference, I absolutely love the fact that Troy Taylor has always kept this at a cheaper price because a lot of conferences out there are really expensive and he keeps this affordable for people. And even though it keeps growing, according to him, we've only been to two, it still feels really intimate. Like you can talk to people at breakfast and everything that are some of the speakers. So I love that. Absolutely. I One thing I've always enjoyed is the community feel. You really do feel like a community and like there's lots of people that come every year and it's not so massive like this Comic-Con or anything where it's you never see the same person twice. It's pretty, it's, it's it, like you said, intimate. It's cool. I was going to say the same thing. I absolutely love that, you know, you're just walking through and it's basically almost feels like everybody you run into, you're kind of shocked if they're not part of the conference because it's just everybody right in that same area. In fact, one lady, I was just assuming she was part of the conference and then I we heard her ask her, I guess, mother-in-law or something like, what is this haunted America thing? And we're like, oh, oops, <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> Yeah, and speakers are are pretty humble, and nobody walks around like they're too cool for anybody. I like that thing, too. Absolutely. My absolute favorite speakers, bar none, were Dana Matthews and Greg Newkirk. Yes, I I love them. They are so real, genuine, and fun. And it was just mind-blowing to watch the videos that they would play where they've been working with Billy, and I'm sure... They obviously talked about them when you interviewed them and mm-hmm. maybe on one of the interviews that you did here as well. And it, it's just amazing to watch how this thing that's a, an idol has gone from screaming EVPs to something that's a little bit more, makes more sense. And I, I just, I really enjoyed listening to them and the fact that they bring these objects so that people can have the opportunity to maybe touch them or at least look at them. And maybe they're not as scary as you think they would be. And just talking to them as individuals, they're very genuine as well. They talk, they could talk all day long and they have some really interesting stories about so many items. Like I remember them talking about, I think it's the wedding dress, the haunted wedding dress that they got from someone that's really old. And it ended up, they believe, being connected to a woman that has shown up in their bedroom and their closet a couple of times. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what? (laughs) You know, things like that. I'm just like, Man, your life must be an endless, <laughs> endless entertainment. Yeah, well, that's what I was laughing because, like Diane said, they're very personable and just very trust trustworthy. And I just enjoyed them a lot as well. I think that was my favorite session. And they almost had me willing to maybe even touch Billy, but then I was like, no. So <laughs> I, I will admire Billy from afar. I didn't touch Billy. Oh, good. See, so I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever looked into their mirror that they have? I have not. They, I don't even know that I've paid attention to that. They have a mirror, a haunted mirror. Well, it's like they call it a black mirror. So it's one of these scrying mirrors. Mm-hmm. And when people look in it, they usually see themselves looking back. Only they look dead. There's maggots in their eyes and stuff. Decomposing. And we had two of our listeners were going to give it a try. Only one of them did. And all I thought to myself is, you know, neither Dana or Greg will look in that mirror and that's theirs. So I'm not about to look in there. If they're not doing it, I'm not doing it. Nope. I think I have a hard enough time looking at myself in the mirror now. I don't need to have those additional uh, characteristics. <laughs> yeah, I don't need the maggots in the eyes. That really, you know, it's it's like you said, it's bad enough, especially first thing in the morning. Now, are you able to, you, you you guys were there for Sarah Soderland too, right? She was the first yes. one on Saturday. What'd you think about that? I love her. I I just, last year and this year, I enjoyed both of her talks. I just, I just love her presentation, the way she uses humor, the things that she says, and just the, the ways that she has different ways to approach thinking about things, you know, just from more of the psychology standpoint of it. So I just, she's one of my favorites as well. Yeah, she would be definitely my second favorite speaker. And as Denise said, I just love that she delves into the psychological side of it. So it's not even, you know, we look at ghosts and try to figure out what is a ghost and studying it. And she kind of looks at it too, from your psychology. Is it something about you that is causing you to see something? 
And I just love her different theories and perspectives on that. And she also is really funny and entertaining when she's talking as well. So she keeps you awake. And I have to say that Troy was brilliant in having her speak first, because I think that's why that room was packed in the morning. And I told her that if she runs out of gigs ever, she could be, you know, the world's first famous paranormal comic. (laughs) She's hilarious. She is. And she has what I really loved about the whole conference was this idea of looking at different theories and not just keeping down the same road that we've been going down and being able to kind of laugh at ourselves when you look at some of the paranormal TV that's out there and being able to just kind of laugh at it rather than be defensive about it. I I just thought that that was a neat kind of ongoing theme through the whole conference. Yeah. And and multiple speakers even talk about how the fact uh, T- uh, Troy Taylor is very skeptical himself about things, and he's the one, you know, organizing it, <laughs> which is cool. So we've got this mix of, uh, you know, you've got your Rosemary Ellen Guiley, which is is very deep, <laughs> and <laughs> and you know goes to some some crazy places, along with you know skeptical minds and people who are openly skeptical, and that's kind of cool. Did you guys? I know that. You know, we're kind of not sure about some of the Rosemary Ellen Guiley uh, far out topics. Did you guys see her on Saturday? We did. And I have to say, we really enjoyed it because I've often wondered about the whole Bigfoot thing and why we haven't ever seen a body. And is it possible that it's trans dimensional? Now, I don't know that I buy into all of her theories because when she starts going down the trans dimensional, you can really get. Uh, woo woo. (laughs) But, you know, I think I also heard Greg and Dana, I think they'd written an article about it. And I can't remember if they talked to you about it in their interview, but could Bigfoot be a ghost? They did. Greg mentioned that he wonders if the reason why he's interested in, in ghost was because of his, no, wait, what did he say? Holy crap. I might've started ghost hunting because of Bigfoot. It didn't even know it. But yeah, he's definitely realizing that there could be a connection with all of his interest in ghosts because of Bigfoot. So that's kind of the road that I was going down listening to her on that. So I was like this. It was really interesting, particularly because last year was a little bit uh, crazy. (laughs) But Denise and all of that. Denise made a great point. She goes, you know, she just kind of killed her whole argument about everything being the gin from last year. Because now she's not saying that Bigfoot is the djinn. It's some kind of trans-dimensional something else. So she's like, what happened to the djinn being Bigfoot? <laughs> yeah, I... Inquiring minds want to know. Yeah, I, it was interesting talking to her when I interviewed her on the show. And I don't know if she realized that she really still hadn't kind of convinced me about the djinn. And I was I was trying to keep him an open mind. And I was a little more inspired to to read the book. And then every time I look at this giant book and (laughs) think about it all being about the gin, I'm just like, Oh, I don't know. I just, I can't do it. I can't do it. Well, for me, it kind of goes along the lines, not, not to put anything down. Cause like, I like to hear everybody's theories, but sometimes it goes along the lines of the religious, right. That will say, well, it's all demonic. Like, I don't Mm -hmm. think it's all, and that's just where I come from. I don't think it's all, any one thing I think you know I think that it's multi-dimensional and and that I liked all the people on the question and answer that said truth is we really don't know what the heck it is you know um what ghosts are and stuff like that so that's what I like because that's where we are as open-minded skeptics we're still we know things happen and we we hear all the stories there's too many stories not to believe but it's like well what is it you know is there a reasonable explanation is it just a residual thing is it energy so it's always that like what what is it and i think that's the fun thing it always keeps us going and searching to find out more answers and then we get to meet even more cool people so so who would you guys like to see at future conferences is there anything now that we've we've seen two um you know what are there any topics or any guests you wish would be covered no i i really enjoyed last year when they had alan brown doing haunted beds and breakfast. So I think I would like something that would be a multiple type thing like that, either haunted jails, haunted asylums, 
I know I we've done an interview on our show with a gentleman called Matt Swain, who's done haunted country music and haunted mm-hmm. rock and roll. That might be really interesting to have him speak there. Yeah, and you you were really moved by him last year. You even got like fifteen books or something that <laughs> he wrote. <laughs> did you? Why- this year, I made sure to take plenty of cash because Alan Brown got all my cash last year. <laughs> and I was like, oh, crap, how are we going to pay for lunch? <laughs> so tell me about some of the you guys with your crew, your spooktacular crew, which, by the way, is a group on Facebook. If you want to find them on Facebook, it's kind of like the big seance parlor. And you guys had some other little meetups elsewhere around the community. I think you did that last year, too, which is cool. You want to tell us about some of those? Okay, well, starting starting off, um, the first morning we got up and a bunch of us went over to Calvary Cemetery together. So there were several of us there um, that either car pulled down or that they that we also met there. And so that was really neat. So we went to see um, Dred Scott's grave. We saw General Sherman's grave. And we, we like to walk through cemeteries and just there's a lot of history in cemeteries. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the, when we, we found the, when they opened the office, we went in to get a map, and I wish that we could have just listened to that guy. He could have gone with us on the tour because he knew the cemetery backward and forward. But he had told us of a particular place called the Garden of the Innocents that I really wanted to go see, not because, I mean, it was, I knew it would be very somber, but it was basically all of the the innocents that they'd found, the babies and children that they'd found just thrown away in trash cans and stuff, their bodies. And so they had buried them in this. So they mm. had taken them, buried them, given them names because they didn't even have names. They they were unclaimed, just forgotten, thrown away, you know, little people. And um, they put all their names on a grave marker. And it was just really powerful in the fact that somebody did that to give them, you know, the honor and the remembrance that they, they buried them for free, you know, no charge and anything like that. But, also just really, really sad. I couldn't help but tear up when we were there, but I really wanted to see it just to to pay honor to all these lost little babies. It was it was really powerful. And then we went over to the Lemp Mansion, which I know you know very well. Mm-hmm. We had lunch there and that was a lot of fun. And then we got to walk around and explore the museum. We weren't able to go upstairs, but it was a really good time. We didn't have any experiences, nothing weird happened to us, but I think everybody really enjoyed hanging out in a haunted location together. And we had the waiters telling us some of their stories and such. Did, uh, how was the food? I've never eaten there. I've been there a couple of times, but I've never eaten. Excellent. We've eaten dinner there and now we've eaten lunch there. And both of them were wonderful. And really reasonably priced. I mean, the prices are fantastic and the food is amazing. You guys rock. Thanks for giving me There's this, this report on the spot. And filling me in since I missed a lot of stuff. Where can we find you in the History Goes Bump? If people go to historygoesbump.com, you can pretty much find out everything about us, where you can listen to the show, and where you can find us on social media. And I want everybody to look forward to the next episode because Diane and Denise are going to be joining me in the parlor for a full episode next time you hear from me. We have a lot to catch up on because it's been two years since your last appearance so thanks ladies you rock you rock too thank yeah, you it's good to see you again patrick you're listening to the big seance podcast with patrick keller look for us on itunes and be sure to check out big for more discussion well i hope you enjoyed this year's coverage of the conference for last year's conference coverage check out episode 67 from July 6th, 2016. I'll throw that link in the show notes too. Lots of links in the show notes today. I think for a Paranerd hashtag for this episode, why don't you find any of the personalities from the conference or in this episode? Find them on Twitter or any social media for that matter. But if it's on Twitter, tag them as well as me at Big Seance and tell them what you loved about this episode. That would be super sweet. And now, it's time to unpack. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit bigseance.com. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. 
You can also find and subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to bigseance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line, 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775-583-5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to bigseance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time. As promised, here's Skeleton Key, Secret Lives of Ghosts, from the band Sunspot. You can find their music on iTunes, as well as Bandcamp, and I'll throw a link in the show notes at BigSeance.com. For more on their podcast, visit OthersidePodcast.com. I was a ghost without a story, a specter looking for a past. Waiting and just watching all these lives pass by so fast I wrote a tale without a hero, I wrote a song without a tune But our stories meet an ending, and I hope that ending's you So hear my prayer, and let me know that you can see me there Skeleton key to set my spirit free tonight. I was a grave without a headstone, wandering the earth forest, alone in a crowd as a soul that's dispossessed. I was a murder without a body, I was a crime without a scene. But this done it needs a hoop, and I hope you'll take my plea. So he. My friend And let me know that you can see me there Exercise Take my hand and let's go toward the light For you're the skeleton key To set my spirit free tonight Tonight